Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Her Excellency, the founder of WASIT, Dr. Lisa Listiana. His Excellency, the president of Makassit Institute, Professor Dr. Jasir Auda. Honorable invitees, representative of institution, University of Erlangga, Win Sheikh M. Jamil Jambek, Win Sunan Kalijaga, University of Siliwangi, Postgraduate Program ITB Ahmad Dahlan, IAIN Kudus, Sebi School of Islamic Economics, Inter-University Center, Indonesian Wakaf Board, Indonesian Association of Islamic Economics, Indonesia Islamic Economic Society Association, and respectable all participants of this seminar. Alhamdulillah, Hirobil Alamin, Wabihi Nastain, Wala umuri dunia wadin, wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wa mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahdi ajma'in. First of all, let's thank the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given us some mercies and blessings so that we can attend this agenda virtually without any troubles and obstacles. Secondly, salawat and salam may always be given to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam who has guided us from the darkness into the lightness. Yes, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Rahmawati Apriliani. Inshallah, will be your host and moderator for today's seminar. Welcome to international webinar, Researching Wakaf Using Makoset Methodology, presented by Wakaf Center for Indonesian Development and Studies, or WASIT, in collaboration with Makwasit Institute to introduce the audience to the Makwasit methodology as an approach for work of research. As an information, this is the second international webinar held by Wasit. Brothers and sisters, on this occasion, allow me to introduce you to this agenda. The first opening by reciting Basmala, the welcoming speech, photo session, presentation, question and answer session, and closing. Distinguished participant, let's open this seminar ceremony by reciting Basmala. Bismillah. Next agenda will be a welcoming speech. Allow us to invite Dr. Lisa Listiana as the founder of WASIT, and Makoset Institute, Econ and Fin Research Group Manager to deliver her welcome remark. Please welcome Dr. Lisa Listia. Insyaallah. Thank you so much, Sister Ira. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Rabi sahri sotri wa yasili amri wa hudata milisan ya kawwali. Alhamdulillah. First of all, it's praise to Allah, the most merciful, the most graceful, and also this be upon Prophet uh, Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, to his family and his companions. And secondly, I would like to convey my gratitude Jazakallah Khaira to our teacher today, Professor Jasar Auda for uh, sharing with us the, his, previous, his precious time to share the knowledge and also the very important topic about Makasit um, methodology and how we can use it and implement it in the work of research. So I would like also to uh, welcoming all the invite uh, guests and also all distinguished participants to this international webinar. And uh, hopefully this program will be beneficial for most of us here. And uh, maybe uh, as an introduction, we see that Alhamdulillah, uh, we, we recognize the increasing trend in work, including in the practical sense and also in the research. But for example, in, in Indonesia itself, uh, Several initiatives to revive the Wakaf sector have been started, like uh, in the issuance of the Wakaf core principles in 2018 and the introduction of the National Wakaf Index to measure the Wakaf performance in the country, the, the uh, issuance of the technical notes of the core principles, and also several um, innovative instrument and financial to accommodate how Wakaf can can uh, be implemented in the more massive way, like the Sukukling Wakaf, Wakafling Sukuk, and we, we hopefully see that 
uh, WACAF can be a, a mainstream, mainstream instrument in the, um, in the Islamic finance and economic, inshallah. And we also can see in, the, in terms of numbers, the, the research with the topic of WACAF, uh, more people put more attention to this, and we see that there is an increasing numbers with the qualitative quantitative approach, the mixed method. And today, we would like to learn um, very important methodology that hopefully later we can also implement in our research in WACF to unlock the, the huge potential of the work as if we, we, we know that WACF has a great of significance to the Ummah and to the Islamic civilization throughout history. And hopefully we can also unlock the potential of the Waqaf in the, this era. And uh, we can also implement this uh, methodology in our research in Waqaf. So uh, hopefully we will uh, uh, learn so much from this lecture. And once again, uh, thank you for Prof. Jasser Auda and also the committee for arranging this this uh, important webinars. So thank you so much. And I hand over back to Sister Ira. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oops. You're on mute, Sister. I think Sister Ira is still in mute. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Reza Listiana, for the, your delightful speech. Before we get into our discussion, the next agenda is documentation session. To all participants, you can turn on your camera and we will capture the screen for several times since we have so many participants today. Brother Kiki. Okay, Mary Kiki. Let me try. One, two, three. Okay. And again, one. Two, three. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, the participants, now we proceed to the main agenda. Already in our midst, Professor Dr. Jasser Auda, as the president of Makassit Institute and the speaker of today's discussion. Assalamualaikum, Professor. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa salam. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Jazakallah khair, my sister. Thank you so much today for today, Professor. So let me brief your CV to the audience before uh, we start the discussion. I am ready anytime, inshallah. Okay. Dear participants, uh, I will brief the professor, Dr. Jasser Awuda, CP. Professor Jasser Awuda is a scholar of Islam. His latest contribution is a new Makassit methodology that aims to bring about a restructuring of Islamic scholarship around a complex network of the higher objectives or Makassit of the Quran and prophetic traditions. He is Al Shatibi Chair for Makassit Studies at the International Peace University in South Africa, a founding and board member of the International Union for Muslim Scholars, an executive member of the Fiki Council of North America, a member of the European Council for Fatwa and Research, and the chairman of the Canadian Fiki Council. He has a PhD in the philosophy of Islamic law from the University of Wales, United Kingdom, and a PhD in system analysis from the University of Waterloo, Canada. Early in his life, he memorized the Quran and undertook traditional studies at the study circles of Al-Azhar Mus in Cairo, Egypt. 
He has held professorial position at the University of Waterloo, Ryerson and Carleton in Canada, Alexandria University in Egypt, Faculty of Islamic Studies in Qatar, American University of Sharjah in United Arab Emirates, and University of Brunei Darussalam in Brunei. He continues to lecture on Islam and its law internationally and has written 25 books in Arabic and English, some of which have been translated to 25 languages. Before the presentation starts, let me tell you how the presentation will go. The speaker will be deliver the presentation for 60 minutes. After that, we have 45 minutes to question and answer session. You can ask your question by typing in the chat box or I uh, or ask directly in the Q&A session letter. Professor, you have 60 minutes to present. Sure. The time is yours, Professor. Allah bless you, Allah bless you. MashaAllah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala as'adi khalqihi wa khatam rusulihi Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Wa radi Allahu al muhajirin wa al-ansar. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen. Thumma amma ba'd. It is such a pleasure to be back in Indonesia. And it is Indonesia as long as we take pictures and so on. So it's really uh, with the picture session. You uh, brought me back to Indonesia right away, that in every speech, there has to be a very precise and nice uh, picture session, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. And it is such a pleasure to, uh, to speak in these initiatives. I have been following uh, the initiatives that uh, Maqasid Institute Indonesia, as well as the work that Dr. Lisa and the whole team is doing. And sometimes they invited me for some of the seminars and talks. And I am so happy to be back and to talk about al awqaf in the Indonesian context. It is, inshallah, a vehicle, a tool for the development of our ummah, for the revival of our ummah. And I am happy that you chose the topic of the maqasid methodology and the awqaf so that we talk about maqasid a little bit in terms of awqaf. When it comes to awqaf, it is very important to rethink the maqasid. The maqasid, qasada yaqsid, is to have a purpose and objective, is to have a goal. And when you do the awqaf, what is the goal? It is very important to ask this question. What the goal is. Uh, and if, if I can uh, mute people who... Uh, to ask the question of, of what the goal is. And we don't want the goal of the awqaf to be hijacked, to be taken for a different agenda from the Islamic agenda because the awqaf are here for the sake of the ummah. It is not accurate when people say that the Quran does not have the word awqaf. Yes, waqafa yaqifu is not in that meaning in the Quran, but the Quran is full of what is called infaq. From the page one of Surah Al-Baqarah, anything that has to do with infaq is partly talking about awqaf. And that is why the Prophet وسلم, in his genius sunnah that he made the awqaf, he actually quoted the Quran, Hadith Umar, I'm not going to go back to what is awqaf and the hadith, of, you know all of this. I'm gonna go straight to the objective of the awqaf. In hadith Umar, when the Prophet وسلم, uh, said for that piece of land that Umar wanted to uh, bring as a charity, عنه, and he said, this is one of the best pieces of land that I ever had. And I wanna give this for the sake of Allah. So the Prophet وسلم, in the hadith told him, Sabbilha. Sabbilha, in Arabic, is 
to make a verb out of fi sabilillah. So in other words, make it fi sabilillah. And therefore, when you read the Quran from beginning to the end, and you see the word fi sabilillah, anfiqu fi sabilillah, this is partly about awqaf. Actually, this is mostly about awqaf. What the Prophet did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was not different from the Quran, but he added one condition, which is that this tasbil fi sabilillah is not something you take back uh, or you inherit or you give as a gift. It is something that you do for Allah. And when you do any infaq fi sabilillah, when you give a poor person a charity, you're not supposed to take it back and you're not supposed to inherit it. Yeah, your children, Allah forbid, you, you die and your children are not going to inherit the money that you gave to the poor person. When you give a charity, by definition, fi sabilillah, is to put it in the way of Allah and to give up the ownership. So what he did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the Hadith Umar, was just to explain that in a very detailed term. So when he told him, la yuba'u, wa la yushtara, wa la yurathu, so it, it's not to be sold, it's not to be purchased, it is not to be uh, inherited, it's just uh, going to be uh, um, locked. That is why another narration of the hadith is called ihbisha or lock it. Habasa yahbisu is to have like a prison, like a lock. You lock the charity. So the concept of awqaf is not only the product of the Islamic civilization. It's actually everywhere in the Quran. And the Prophet ﷺ added that condition that it is locked. The ownership is locked so that he ﷺ ensures, and now we're talking about maqasid, ensures the sustainability of that charity. What is the purpose? The purpose is to be charity, but to be sustainable, to be sustainable. One of the major objectives of awqaf, and I want to start with that, because I think this is a fundamental point, that it is a pillar of the Islamic economics. And this is the bigger picture that we have to see, even though today I'm speaking to you from Canada, the Canadian capital, Ottawa, and some of you are in Indonesia and other countries, in every country in the world, including the Muslim countries, we live in a capitalist economic system where we use some paper that doesn't have any value, but it is defined by the government. And this value is going to be customarily used for buying and selling and mahar and so forth. And the central bank makes money out of nowhere by decisions from the government, uh, governing bodies anyway. So they click on the button and we are one trillion more and we are whatever. And that one trillion goes to the branch banks with interest. And then the banks are going to lend it to the people in the economic cycle that you know. And because the system is like that and these pieces of paper are not equivalent to any value, they are not equivalent to metal or land or salt or anything. They are just made with the power of the state and the authority of the state. Then the system itself does not have a real foundation in terms of economy. The, the foundation is the power of the state. And yes, we deal with the system and we go and buy and sell and people give a mahar for marriage and pay a compensation for diya and pay zakah and do hajj and umrah and everything with that money because that's what we have. This is the status quo. But in the beginning of this lecture, I want my brothers and sisters to know that the Islamic economy is not like that. The Islamic economy is an economy where the currency has a value. And if you print something that you call a suck, that suck cannot be uh, sold. It has to represent something 
that you could cash, that you could receive. But it's not supposed to be bought and sold like that. It's not my topic. My topic is that the awqaf are the pillar of the real Islamic economy, which means that the economy from the Islamic point of view is based on charity. So everything is charity. No, not everything. There is charity and there is zakah, which is a different kind of, there's awqaf and the zakah, two kinds of charity. And then there is what's called bayah. Bayah is Allah made bay'ah, Allah made trade lawful, and he made riba or usury unlawful, haram. So to, to trade is part of Islam too, is part of the Islamic economy. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in his Quran, when he talked about fi sabilillah and the infaq, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his seerah and his sunnah, when he illustrated that and gave us examples, he did not allow bayah in people's lives. First of all, in people's deen, you're not supposed to sell your deen. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is talking about people selling their deen. And you're not supposed to sell the truth or sell justice or sell Islam um, for a price. So, and you're not supposed to trade in people's lives. Life and death is not a commodity in Islam. And uh, when people trade in life and death, they are not doing the Islamic economy. You are not supposed to trade in people's pain and people's needs. Uh, or people's poverty, or people's uh, sadness. This, these are not commodities. In Islam, you should buy and sell material things. So you go and buy cloth, you go and buy something to eat or drink, you buy a piece of house or piece of land. But the basic needs of the society are not commodities. So in Islam, Education is not a business, is not commodity. Health is not a business, is not a commodity. When you talk about the awqaf of relief, relief, when you feed the hungry, this is not a business. Books is not a business from the Islamic perspective. The food is not, yes, it is a business, but not you cannot trade in people's hunger. You're not supposed to have hungry people. And this is not a business. Um, the, the markets are not supposed to be monopolized by the rich. The research is supposed to be part of what the ummah does and is not supposed to be part of the buying and selling. And therefore, the objective of awqaf is to free the ummah is to strengthen the ummah, is to make this ummah of Islam a, an independent, a strong ummah, a healthy ummah. You are not supposed to trade in the deen, and therefore masajid are awqaf, because a masjid cannot be a company. You cannot just open a masjid as a profitable company, and everyone who enters the masjids puts uh, 10 rupee or 100 rupee or something. That is not the Islamic concept of worship. Islamic concept of masajid or the ibadat or the sha'air is a concept where a masjid is supposed to be built from charity. And the masjid becomes a waqf. It cannot be sold and it cannot be inherited and so forth. But it's not only the masjid. So far, the awqaf, not just in Indonesia, but everywhere, in the Muslim majority countries and here in the West, most of the awqaf are masajid. But in the Islamic concept proper, the awqaf are not only masajid. Masajid are a small part. The awqaf are the universities and the schools and the hospitals and the, the food, you know, the basic food. The awqaf are for making da'wah and for markets, and I'll get to that. So the concept of awqaf 
is very different from the concept of charity because the awqaf in Islam is at the heart of the Islamic economy. The Islamic economy is an economy where people make money because they have skills and they can buy and sell, can buy anything and sell anything, but these things. And then when you have some money, you give a will to the awqaf or you give a charity or you say this piece of land is a waqf or that building or something of that sort or cash or any of that, that is going to be part of the waqf. Um, and it is important to know that the objective of the waqf is for the maslaha of the ummah. Let me share a few slides since uh, I have some time to share some slides with you. Um, so let us talk about maqasid methodology a little bit. Uh, it's a methodology that does believe in three circles of realization of fiqh, the real fiqh of Islam, the fiqh, the understanding, not just the law, not just in courts, but the fiqh of awqaf is one of those fiqh. That's a very important chapter. Research is very important and research cannot be done without education and education cannot be done without action. So what you do research on has to have an educational application. So I write a, a thesis. That thesis has to be a book that could be taught to somebody. Or you write a paper that is going to be given to training or something. Education has to be tied to research. And action has to be tied to research and education. Because you cannot just have a very high education and then no action on the ground. That's why I'm very happy with the initiatives that we are talking about today. Inshallah, in the Q&A, we'll talk about them more. And you cannot just do research in isolation from the society. Research in Islam has to be applied. We no longer could afford to do research by spending many years on a manuscript or on the comparison between two historical events or two historical people or any of that that are not relevant to today, even if you're talking about a thought level. But we have to have action and education and research go hand in hand. I've written a humble book that uh, if you're interested in, I can uh, put a copy for the participants here uh, to read. And it's called Re Envisioning Islamic Scholarship. And this book is a few hundred pages where we discuss a methodology perhaps more for the students and people who are interested in what we call an Islam ishtihad or reasoning or thinking. If you are interested at a deep level, I can send you inshallah a copy of that. I'll leave my email and I will give a copy to the organizers because you can read a few hundred pages if you wish to get into uh, some uh, talk on the usul level, on the fundamental theoretical level of developing research and developing curricula. I talk about Islamic studies today and how we can classify them, talk about secularism versus Islamic approaches and so forth. So in Arabic and English, so I have in Arabic too, uh, actually written originally in Arabic for those who would like. Now, this is the heart of the book that has to do with the methodology or some sort of a guideline. You really cannot guide ishtihad or research in Islam in a algorithm like one, two, three, four. It's not a flow chart. It's not like that. When I tell you to read the Quran and build a framework and have a purpose and do literature comparison, within the literature comparison, you could go back to the Quran and see something or the Sunnah, or you can uh, revise the framework based on the purpose. These things are not isolated uh, silos or steps, but they are supposed to be uh, mixed and networked. And let us talk a little bit about that before I get into particularly the uh, application of waqf. The purpose here is what I'm talking about, is what is our purpose from the awqaf? And that purpose, the general purpose of the awqaf is important. I flipped through the recent research that is done on the awqaf, uh, whether in Indonesia or other Islamic institutes. And I personally supervise 
uh, students, graduate students in different universities, different countries. So, and we have on the Maqasid Institute website, inshallah, coming up soon, an e-library with thousands of research um, papers and books and so on. From surveying the recent approaches to awqaf, I could see that there is a word that is very common in the research on awqaf that is put as an objective of the awqaf, which I disagree with. And that word is the SDGs, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals are not supposed to be the objectives or the maqasid of the awqaf. The Sustainable Development Goals could be the objectives of a state or a government. Yes, the government is going to do development and is going to um, ensure innovation and so forth and quality education and employment and so forth. But Islam does not think about society this way. Um, when it comes to, let's say, quality education, education in Islam that is funded by awqaf is not market driven. It is actually social benefit driven, social welfare driven. Education in Islam is supposed to educate people for the good of the society, not for the growth of the market. Is the good of the society different from the growth of the market? Yes, it is. Sometimes the market is growing and the society is poor and people are hungry, uh, especially post-COVID. We see in the West here, I'm speaking to you from Canada, which is supposed to be one of the most wealthy um, Western nations. I was just hearing the parliament today and they were saying that 51%, let's say 50% of Canadians have a problem feeding their families at the end of the month. You're talking about hunger in Canada let alone in the States, let alone in Indonesia or the Arab world. So the, 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 the economy is growing. There is GDP and Canada is one of the G7. And we have General Motors here, a huge company, and we have oil. But the Islamic economic philosophy is not about the growth of the economy. It is about the welfare of the people. And therefore, when you think about quality education, you have to know that this education has to be for the welfare, for the maslaha of the people. Yes, I know that one of the uh, sustainable development goals is no poverty, but the Islamic approach is not like that. Islamic approach is no monopoly, is not no poverty. In Islam, we have poor and we have rich. That is normal. But what is not normal is when the poor is hungry, that is not Islamic. That is an emergency that allowed the poor to go steal from the rich. That is Islam proper. The Sharia says that. And the rich are not supposed to be monopolous in the sense that Allah said subhanahu wa ta'ala, money is not supposed to circulate between the rich. And that is what happening. Money is circulating in the 1% and then sometimes in the 10%. And sometimes in the, you know, 20, 30 percent and then 50 percent and under, which are the hungry people in Canada, money is not circulating. People are working. And when they take days off or when the government closes businesses for health reason or any of that, people go hungry. People don't cannot afford not to work for one week. Otherwise, they're hungry. 50 percent of Canadians are like that. So my point is that the Islamic economics is not like that, is not about growth. And the government could do this. And of course, politics is very hard and they can have their business. But we're not talking about government when we talk about awqaf, because awqaf is for the civil society. Awqaf is a charity. The government, you don't give charity to the government, you give taxes to the government, that's different. But when you talk about charity that builds universities and colleges, and schools, the objective is to give the student knowledge. And that knowledge has to be useful for the ummah, for the community. First of all, for, for me, as a student of knowledge, 
I have to know how to live. I have people who come and do, I don't know, a PhD with me in Islamic studies. And sometimes he has a PhD in economics or a PhD in biomedics. And, and they don't know anything about history, about the history of Islam and, and how, how they come, how come they're here. They don't know anything about economics. They have no even enough knowledge to feed themselves properly or to feed their kids and treat the kids and deal with the public issues in a, an intellectual way, in, in, an, in a learned way. We have so many people who are graduates of schools that the UN is calling for, yes, but they are ignorant. They don't know how to deal with life. They have mental issues. Mental issues are now like, I don't know, the majority of Western societies. And therefore, education that the awqaf is funding is not meant to serve the market, but meant to serve the welfare, the maslaha of the ummah. And the maslaha of the ummah, yes, could be partly about markets and buying and selling, but the maslaha of the ummah as you know, it's about the deen, and nafs, and aql, and ard, and mal. It's about, you know, the human being. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran as a maslaha or manfa'ah. Education that is based on awqaf is different from the education that is not based on awqaf. Because once you are a teacher, or a professor, or somebody who is doing research, and you are free from funding interests, then you are serving Islam and not so serving the funding agency. Uh, I worked as a professor, as my sister mentioned in the introduction, in many universities, alhamdulillah, East and West in Canada here and all the way to East Asia and the Arab world. And I could see that research is, is not going on the straight path because the funding agencies have interest in the research. So you want to research a cure for cancer. N not so many people are interested in that, unless you're going to develop a pill that is going to pr be protected by intellectual property and make a few billion dollars for somebody. But if you discover a plant that is going to cure cancer, or if you say that, well, plastic and sugar and these things are actually causing cancer, uh, this research is not going to give you a PhD, is not going to allow you to be promoted if you are a professor, because you are going against the, the, you know, the interests of the industry. Um, a few years back, a professor in France, and a Muslim professor in France, discovered how to use water for car fuel. So instead of the good old oil from Arabia, we now could use water. He was killed. He was actually murdered by the mafia that has interests in the oil. And therefore he lost his life over that. I'm talking about education and research that is funded by the awqaf and therefore freeing our education institutions and our research institutions from the impact of businesses and governments. Um, I as my sister mentioned, grew up learning the Quran in Al-Azhar Mosque. And I'm quite familiar with the institution. Uh, the institution pre what is called the Egyptian revolution in the 50s of the previous century was based on Awqaf, Al-Azhar, and many other Islamic universities that you go and study in were Awqaf. And therefore the shuyukh of Al-Azhar were independent. They were not workers in the government, they were awqaf. And therefore, they elect a Shaykh al-Azhar that is not necessarily Egyptian, as in Republic of Egypt or any of that. Shaykh al-Azhar uh, in, back in the, in the days was Tunisian, was Sheikh al-Khidr Hussein, was an Indone a Tunisian Sheikh from Tunis. But the Sheikhs thought that he was, um, he should be Shaykh al-Azhar, they elected him. Now, post the Arab leftist governments or totalitarian regimes that replaced the old colonial regimes, Arabs decided that the awqaf 
are dangerous on the politics. And therefore, they canceled most of the Awqaf. Al-Azhar is one of them. The Awqaf is no longer. Al-Azhar now is a department under a government. And Shaykh Al-Azhar is a minister. That makes Shaykh Al-Azhar part of a government. I'm not saying the government is bad, but I'm saying that he's not free because he is an employee in a government. That is a different philosophy for education from a university where the sheikh of the university is not a minister. is doesn't have to go by the government policy. He has to go by the society under him, by the curricula, how it developed and everything. And you can say that this has to do with what you call in the West here, academic freedom. Uh, we define it differently in the secular system. But we have this concept of al-amana al-ilmiyya, the knowledge, the trust of knowledge from day one. And al-alim from day one is supposed to be free. And that is why the imams, if you go back to the seerah of Abu Hanifa and Shafi'i and Malik and Ahmad, they did not work for governments. They did not like to be part of a palace because they wanted to be free. And until today, scholars who are free are different from scholars who work for governments. I'm not saying they're bad, but they work for governments. They serve a government. In Islam, the educational systems are not supposed to be under the governments because the governments have a different job to do from the job of Islamic education. The Islamic education has to be independent and has to be governed from the bottom up. When you take another example, when it comes to awqaf, which is health, trade in life and death is not an Islamic bayah. You cannot do bayah in that. And therefore, you say that this pill is going to cost you a million dollars because it will save your life. But if it's only for headache, it will cost you one cent. But it will, if it saves your life, it costs a million dollars. That is trade in health. And this is not the Islamic paradigm. The Islamic economic paradigm when it comes to health is that a health system is independent from business and independent from the government. Yes, a hospital could buy medicine and could hire a doctor and give the doctor a salary, but the hospital itself is a waqf system. That is the Islamic system. Um, the hospitals were a concept that was known by the Greeks and the Romans and so before Islam. But Islam changed the concept of hospitals. From the first hospital in Islam, the hospital of Rufayda, anha, the female companion of the Prophet ﷺ, she built a tent in the mosque. And you know the history of Rufayda. Rufayda built the, the first waqf of hospital, Mashfa. And then eventually the Muslim world had so many awqaf until today, there are a few of them, but now much smaller. The, the, the concept here is that medicine is a right. Medicine is not a trade. And therefore, the purpose, the objective, the maqsid of building a hospital is health, is not to make profit. Now, health is one of the major profits. And yes, a doctor in the old times was rich. Because to be a doctor, it takes a lot of training and a lot of skill. So yes, you could be a rich doctor because you get a good salary. But the system is not just, is not selling drugs, basically. The system is a system that is based on awqaf. And because of the awqaf, it is actually giving you uh, the medication, physical or mental. Mental medication was also a part of the history of Islam, of the awqaf. And the purpose here is your health, al-afiyah. Al-afiyah is, is to be healthy. And al-afiyah is for the badan and a nafs, for the physical and a nafs too, for the soul as well. So um, you had a precedent in our history of so many hospitals that were built on the concept of waqf as the foundation of the economy, the economic activity in the medical field. In Islam proper, research is awqaf as well. Started with Bayt al-Hikmah in Baghdad, 
uh, and Beit al Hikmah developed so much research in how to measure time and the moon and the sun and the earth and astronomy and optics and gravity and machines for all sorts of things. And eventually in North Africa, in India, all the way to East Asia and in China today and in former Soviet uh, republics and Africa, all of this had buyut al-hikmah, had houses of research, houses of wisdom. These houses of wisdom were in, you know, in bringing scientists or scholars, fuqaha, but fuqaha in the very wide sense, not fuqaha as in clergy only, but fuqaha is in the bigger sense. And those fuqaha studied the animals and the plants and medicine and stars. Uh, they studied the geography and history. They copied books of hadith and tafsir. They did everything in Bayt al-Hikmah in the waqf sense. So the waqf was actually spending on that. And the independence of research centers is very important, as I mentioned. Now, from that came the books, the houses of books, libraries. Libraries is an Islamic, you know, it's not exactly an Islamic concept new, but the new in the Islamic concept is that libraries were awqaf. And you have most of the scholars of fiqh proper as in jurisprudence, they don't have the concept of copyright on books because they say that knowledge is not supposed to be sold. The, the, the philosophy here is that knowledge is supposed to be for everybody. And therefore you could copy a book that is in the old times. Today, I, I don't know, you have to go by the law. You have to respect the law anyway. But I'm just giving you the original objectives of the awqaf that are not really the sustainable development goals because the sustainable development goals um, is talking about economic freedom as a tool for um, the growth of the economy and is talking about the IP or the intellectual property agreements as the tool for innovation. And it's a very different system from the system that the awqaf is actually aiming to produce in the society. And as I mentioned, the government could deal with that, but the civil society is not supposed to be doing this. The civil society is supposed to be uh, doing the awqaf with the original objective. The awqaf were also for the environment, what we call today the environment. And you find that until today, cats and dogs in Istanbul, like if you visit Istanbul, they are, fed by charity and the old cities uh, and, and so forth are actually places where you give charity for the birds and the cats and the dogs and the animals in the wild for them to have a, a, a life that is preserved, a preserved life of the wildlife and the animals and the forests. And that was awqaf, that was part of our legacy of fi sabilillah. And why is it fi sabilillah? Because it's my responsibility. The Prophet Sallallahu talked about the woman who had a cat, starved her cat, and Allah punished her with fire because she starved her cat. And he talked about the other woman who fed the dog or the thirsty dog who was very thirsty, he would die. And when she fed him and gave him water, Allah gave her jannah. And the Prophet Sallallahu was very upset when the uh, Bedouins did not feed their camel. And he said that they have to feed the camel. You cannot just treat the camel as a thing. He is a living being. He is umamun amthalukum. They are nations like you. And we have a responsibility as khulafa, as successors on earth, to take care of the environment and not to uh, endanger any of the animals. When some of the companions killed some of the dogs in Medina, the Prophet said, do not kill the dogs. They are nations like you. It's not about killing. You kill the dog that is dangerous on people's lives, but not any dog like that. You don't kill any nation. Uh, the ants, he has a hadith about the ants and the bees in the Quran and so forth. Now, let me also give you one of the objectives of the awqaf that has to do with what we can call today the, um, the employment of the unemployed. 
the markets or the souq, the public souq, the public market, in the Islamic concept proper, is actually public funds, is actually awqaf. From the awqaf, you build a market. And therefore, if you don't have a job and you want to be a trader, you go to the market and you trade, you buy and sell. And the souq or the market, if you don't have a place to stay, they give you a place to stay. They give you a room to make a shop and you start trading. Now in the system we live under, you cannot trade without a credit, without taking a loan from the bank, without renting a place that's expensive and therefore you're going and dealing with the financial system. And the Islamic financial system is not based on credit. And it's not supposed to be based on credit. It's supposed to be based on people's will to trade or to work. And therefore, the idea of the souq that is a waqf, so a souq from the charity or a market from the charity, that is a brilliant idea. That means that unemployment is zero because anybody could go and sell anything. And we have this, but we have it only for the poor people today. People who are street vendors, they go sell food on the street. But this is the heart of the Islamic bay'ah system. The bay'ah system is not based on the richness of the person that is translated into a nice word that's called the credit. Because when you're rich, your credit is high. You pay your debts. Now, that credit system is not how the Islamic economic paradigm is envisioned, and therefore part of what we do should be part of that. So if I may go back to my presentation and therefore perhaps give you some of the objectives. Now, what are the objectives therefore of the awqaf? You know the objectives of the mosques. That is well known. We pray in the mosque. Uh, we make sure that the mosque is a place for the community and so on. But the waqf has an objective also for the markets. That is an important objective. And we should work on a project that takes awqaf, people's donations, and build a market, build a market for people who would like to trade because that is the Islamic system. And to translate our schools and universities into independent awqaf based uh, institutions. I'm not sure in Malaysia, uh, in, in Indonesia, I'm sorry, how, how it works or in East Asia in general. But I know that in the Arab world, most of the schools and universities are no longer awqaf. They are just private business. Uh, in Islam proper research is part of that awqaf system. Libraries, uh, public libraries at least, we should build libraries where people go and read and copy books and learn based on the awqaf. We should make sure that we have clinics, even though we have a parallel system that we cannot change today, that is a private hospitals and private clinics. But we should make sure that part of the awqaf projects that we have is to open clinics so that the poor people could get their medication and, and so forth. And this has to be part of that. And perhaps a good idea is to open the clinics with the mosques. You could learn from the model of so many uh, hospitals in the mosques in, in the Arab world, where you find that one of the floors of the mosque is made a hospital. Uh, physicians volunteer and surgeons volunteer their time for the charity. Uh, the basic needs here of food and drink and water and so on has to be part of the awqaf. Uh, the um, hadith of Uthman radiallahu anhu when the water was a problem in Medina and people were buying water from the Jews of Medina at that time. And the Jews of Medina, because water is important, they raised the price of the water. So the Prophet wasallam said, who could buy the well, the well of Medina and make it free for everybody? He wanted to free the community from the monopoly of the water of the Jews of Medina at that time. And this is a very economic example. Here is economics working for you, that if the water is going to be sold at a high price and people are going to be thirsty, then you go to the awqaf. If the food is going to be a problem, you go to the awqaf. If shelter, having 
a roof above your head is a problem, then you go to the awqaf because that is a right. A people cannot get married. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu had a precedent of this. When people cannot get married, he made them got, get married from Bayt al-Mal, from the zakah and from the awqaf that people gave to Bayt al-Mal at that time from the public trust because getting married is part of the basic needs in the Islamic paradigm. Environmental responsibilities, we should take care of the animals around us and the plants, and all of these are nations like us. They are not supposed to be just for food, but they are actually nations like us that we have responsibility. Relief uh, is part of the awqaf insurance. When people uh, don't have an insurance, the awqaf is supposed to pay for that. Uh, it's a different system from the insurance companies, but this is how it is. Uh, even you read in the old literature, when uh, somebody is a servant and they break a cup or they break up a plate, they go and replace the plate from the awqaf because they didn't want the servant to be punished for breaking a plate. Uh, that is how you build a civilization. And finally, relatives. Uh, one of the best ways of making your relatives, your children or relatives that you care about, uh, sustainable is to build a waqf uh, that's called the waqf al-aili or, or the family waqf. So you don't own it anymore. And yes, it goes to the relatives, but it is locked. Uh, they cannot, you know, sell the land after you or sell the, um, the, the you know, whatever business that brings the revenue, but to give them a sustainable revenue, if you wish. That is also one of the economic policies uh, in, in the Islamic paradigm. I um, tried to discuss the issue of the purpose or the maqasid. I did not get into those five steps of the algorithm uh, that uh, we propose in the maqasid methodology. And of course, the elements of research that we uh, tell our researchers um, to follow. Let me see if I can bring that up. Uh, the elements of research that are the objectives and the concepts and the proofs, the groups, universal laws, uh, co commands and values, and how to integrate all of these, how to integrate the objectives with the concepts and the proofs, and how to read the book of Allah with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in a cycle of reflection. There are so many details that uh, I inshallah put this uh, uh, book for you in the chat that you can read about. I just wanted to try to um, make a point about the general objective of the awqaf. The awqaf to me are one of the important tools for the empowerment of the ummah, of its scholars and its mosques and its schools and its institutions. And I think to empower the ummah is better for any country because the responsibility of the welfare of the people should not only be a responsibility of the government, but also the civil society should take care of the food and the water and the health and the education. The civil society in this case contributes. Uh, the people, the ummah contributes to its welfare and the government also has its objectives. It's not against anything, but it's about the ummah taking, uh, taking back some of its authority some of its role in the civilization and not for the ummah to be only consumers. Uh, that is the wrong economic policy and awqaf should not be contributing to that, but contributing to the other direction instead of being consumers to be producers of knowledge, producers of markets and producers of value. Uh, again, I'm very happy to speak in the awqaf forums that you have. And I'm looking forward to questions. I see stuff on the chat. Again, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, more than happy, inshallah, to discuss. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Professor. It's still 10 minutes actually, but okay, we okay we open the Q&A questions. So to the participants, we have uh, two sessions. The first session will be two or three questions from the audience to ask directly. Okay, the first one, Mr. Halil Mukarrobin. 
Michelle. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the the opportunity um, uh, about the question. Okay, I will just uh, strike forward for the question. Uh, my first question uh, in terms of uh, cash uh, work of um, <clears throat> cash work of uh, is it uh, contradict with the objective of uh, Sharia? Uh, because when we look at uh, at the cash work of, uh, I saw um, there is. Um, Shifting, shifting paradigm uh, in terms of uh, cash work of uh, they, they, um, they more likely uh, profit inter, uh, uh, profit uh, interest. They're not uh, going to the objective of uh, Islam, which is the al maslah amma, the benefit of the public interest. Um, what do you think uh, about it, uh, uh, Professor Auda? Uh, um. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, can I ask uh, another one? Okay. Please go. Go ahead. The another question is in terms of uh, copyright of books. Um, uh, I, it just come out from my mind uh, during your um, explanation about the the work. Uh, is uh, also the copyright of book uh, contradict the, the the objective of the uh, of the um, of the work of uh, because we know uh, the, the copyright uh, of book when you're talking about the uh, Darul Hikmah and so forth, and um, you're talking about the the objective should be a uh, knowledge. But uh, I when I when I um, when I see um, the phenomena of the copyright of book and also the journals, um, um, some of the journals are not uh, free. They sh we should uh, you know we should uh, pay uh, with a lot of money. Is it is it contradict with the objective of um, uh, Sharia in terms of uh, no, uh, knowledge? Because uh, books, it's a part of uh, the knowledge. Uh, is it contradict with with that? Okay. Barakallahu uh, feekum, akhir. Zakallah khair. No, cash waqf uh, is one of the awqaf that you could make. I am not sure why people who um, say that cash waqf is not allowed, what, what do they rely on? Um, I know that I know what they say. I mean, they say that it has to be an asset. Um, but with all due respect, I don't think they understand what a cash is, because a cash is a piece of paper. It's just where we don't have dollars to show you. It's just a piece of paper that represents a value, and that value is printed in a riba way. The riba is not equal to interest. Riba is the whole system. So my point is that, no, cash, waqf, is allowed. And if they are talking about the asset not vanishing or disappearing, everything disappears. The piece of land will disappear. The building will disappear. Khalid, uh, anhu, in the hadith, when the Prophet وسلم, said that Khalid made a waqf of his armor and his horse, Khaled's horse disappeared too, and it is more valuable than a piece of dollars. That's just a piece of paper that doesn't have value in Islam, doesn't have legitimacy really. But we use it because of custom. We use the papers because of custom. So I disagree with people who said that you cannot do cash waqf. I think you can do cash waqf, but we should also make sure that the cash is invested in the best ways. Once you deal with cash, you are dealing with a ribawi system. It's not just the interest in a bank. The interest in a bank, to me, to me, my opinion, interest in a bank is the least amount of riba that you can do with a piece of paper because money markets is riba. You cannot trade in money in Islam, but money markets, they made a hila and they call it murabaha. So my point is that, no, it's it cash waqf is a legitimate kind, inshallah. There is no problem with this. And if you want, I can give you an official opinion from, from my perspective. The other point that has to do with the copyright. Uh, no, in Islam, the philosophy of information is not that information is a property. Uh, Islam doesn't view information this way. And yes, you could develop something and you sell that something, but you cannot use the information property agreements 
as a tool for power, for hegemony, which is what happened today. Like people who say that intellectual property, according to Maqasid, is hifz al-mal or hifz al-aql, they don't understand intellectual property. They should go and educate themselves about how the intellectual property is being used for the sake of hegemony, for colonization, basically. Do I copy books without rights? No, usually not. Like, unless I really have to or whatever, or when I was a student and it, it really is an individual case by case. I cannot give you a fatwa about that, but I'm talking about the bigger system. The bigger system is that information is not supposed to be sold. Um, if somebody has rights on a book, then respect the rights. I, as an individual, I respect the rights. Um, unless the book is old, unless, you know, something, or I take a small part of it. But I'm talking about the Islamic philosophy of knowledge, um, not giving a particular fatwa on intellectual property. So I hope the answer is clear, inshallah. Thank you, Professor. So the next, Mr. Kobit. Inshallah. Can you hear my voice? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Alhamdulillah. I already followed your series of lectures many times, but Alhamdulillah, this time I can uh, talk with you directly, Prof. Oh, anytime, anytime. Okay, I have uh, two questions, inshallah. Um, my name is Qabit from Uwin Sunan Ampel, Surabaya, said Islamic University of Sunan Ampel, Surabaya. Uh, my first question is uh, related with your approach, uh, Maqasid, uh, Maqasid approach, Prof. I, 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 my background uh, uh, from international relations, particularly uh, political science, um, my question is, is there any possibility to implement your approach uh, to other disciplines beyond your uh, background, maybe, uh, Especially, you always uh, relate to the Makassit approach to the economics field. Uh, is there any possibility to implement it uh, beyond that uh, specific discipline of science? And uh, maybe you may give us a little bit uh, 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 a real example to implement it uh, beyond the, the, the economic science. My second question is regarding to your, the topic of uh, walk of prof uh, in the uh, international political constellations we 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 know each other it is a general threat and a common knowledge i think that capitalist system very hegemon in our world order and uh, the aims of that capitalist society very very um, different with the Islamic purposes of economics. And you, you say it just a moment that um, many institutions, ac academic campus that actually should have belonged to Waqaf, to Islamic society, no, <laughs> recently some Arab countries, and also in Indonesia, Prof, that uh, maybe uh, they they are they are thinking about profit profit and profit uh, capitalist so capitalist profit and that's uh, that is the real things that uh, happened in our society in islamic in ummah uh, society so uh, could you uh, give us the best example maybe that you already done with um how how uh, you 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 promote and implement the 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 walk of uh, principle with the Islamic teaching principle within uh, your society in in Canada maybe in the Western and uh, uh, could you please uh, give an analysis and uh, what uh, we have to do um, strategically strategically yep. as a Muslim Ummah today to um, come up with this overcoming with these situations with the formula of the Islamic economics, especially with Waqaf. Thank you, Prof. Nice to- Barakallahu Barakallahu 
I want to show you uh, something uh, that I gave recently uh, um, about about the uh, what you called. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, basically, in terms of the application of the Maqasid methodology, um, we proposed in this book, and I'll put it on the chat for you, inshallah. And no, don't worry about copyright of that uh, of that book. Um, basically, we are dividing the Islamic studies into four different areas. One is the usuli studies that has to do with the Quran and the Hadith and the usul and the kalam and so forth. But the other one is disciplinary studies. And I've written uh, you know, a number of pages on that. How do you restructure a discipline? So you are in, it, in international relations, excuse me. How can you restructure it? What do you look for? What are the basic objectives and concepts? How do you deal with universal laws? How, what is the role of the values and the role of the commands and so forth? So yes, there is an application. Uh, of the Maqasid methodology on international relations and every discipline, actually. Uh, today, I talked about economics mostly because I'm talking about awqaf, which is dedicating money or assets for the, sake, for the sake of Allah. So I try to talk more about the economic paradigm, but I would like to refer you to this part of the book and I'll put the book for you. What I mentioned here as well is phenomena studies in this classification. Why? Because international relations, if you only think about it in terms of a discipline that has its own epistemology and its own concepts and its own books, and you don't deal with multiple disciplines and you don't go beyond disciplines to the phenomena that you are analyzing, then you are not going to be able to deal with the discipline ac accurately. So for example, Wars are not just international relations phenomena. They are also an economic phenomena. They are a water phenomena. They are a cultural phenomena. They have many sides of them. A war is not just within the international uh, po polit uh, political science kind of lens, but it must be a phenomena that goes beyond the disciplines. So inshallah, I'll put in, in the chat a copy of that. About the profit and bayah and so on, there is no problem to make profit, but you have to make profit from selling something. Uh, and, and that selling, as I mentioned, should not be the education and the health and, and the basic services in the society. The basic services in the society should be about the awqaf. How? I think we should re-spread uh, re the culture of awqaf until maybe a century ago, we had a culture of that. We have a history of awqaf and you read about our ancestors in everywhere in the Muslim majority lands that they, they donated to the awqaf and they built awqaf because they believed in that. It was part of the culture. Many Muslims today, they don't even know what a waqf is. They don't even understand. Or they think that awqaf equal mosques only. Masajid, but not hospitals and animal shelters and hunger uh, solving issues and uh, and so forth. And that's a, that's a bigger kind of uh, awqaf. So I think we should bring back the culture of awqaf by giving uh, a lot of publicity to these initiatives, uh, like the initiatives that uh, my brothers and sisters work on here, and and to re bring the awqaf back to the Islamic culture. So I hope that this answers the question. And Akhi, I will leave my email. Please be in touch. It's not uh, difficult to be in touch with your brother. Uh, no, no worries, I am uh, at your service. And I'll put, inshallah, a copy of that file I'm telling you about, inshallah. Zakullah khair. Thank you, Professor Jinsar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kobit, for the questions. And I will read the question from the chat box. This is from Miss Umi Rohma. The first question, uh, uh -huh. Professor Auda, if you say that Waqaf proposed is the public good, what does it mean? Do you mean it equals to the social welfare? In what sense of the public good? And 
Uh, and the second, second one, uh, in Indonesia was mostly targeted for education, health and praying facilities. But now Wakaf proposed has been shifting to research grant, building economic facilities and other new purpose. How, uh, what do you think of this change? How is the dynamic of Wakaf in Western societies? Uh, the social uh, welfare is the purpose of the Waqf, if you want to speak in English. Uh, in the Maslaha, uh, in, in the Arabic sense, is Maslaha to Ummah. It's the welfare of the Ummah, the good of the Ummah. I am just warning, as I did in the lecture, that the social welfare is not necessarily defined in economic terms. Sometimes Western economics or capitalist economics that does not define social welfare properly because it defines it based on the benefits of the rich or the companies or the businesses. And the social welfare in Islam has to do with what's called basic needs or the natural rights in Islam. What are natural rights in Islam? To eat and drink, to wear clothes, to get married, to have a shelter, to have a means of transportation, the basic needs. And some of the scholars put it in the maqasid sense, the preservation of the deen uh, and the nafs, the soul uh, from danger and offspring, the family and al-aql, you know, the preservation of mind. You can also think about them this way, which are the objectives about the welfare of the human, not the welfare of the companies. Are the welfare of the companies different from the human? Yes, sometimes. Sometimes companies like to make profit even if they ruin the environment. They want to make profit even if they break the road or they pollute the water because it's profitable. And yes, companies do that. But as Muslims, we are not supposed to pollute the water or the environment or trade in people's lives to make profit because this is not a, a business like the other businesses. The other question that has to do uh, with education, and, and new purposes. Well, every new purpose, inshallah, is legitimate as long as it does not contradict with Islam. So yes, we, we could have new awqaf for new objectives and new services and new kinds of welfare or maslaha of the ummah, but just to make sure that it is really serving the people and it is not uh, something that is uh, different from what is the interest of the people. And yes, there is no problem in making cash waqf in order for people to receive uh, you know, the, the, the money in cash and that cash would be invested. This is a very good tool that is new, but I think it's a useful tool, inshallah. Thank you, Professor. And the questions from Ms. Lisa, Listiana. The first one, considering the flexibility or ijtihadi nature of wakaf, how far the innovation can be made, what is the limit? And the second, since the Maqasid methodology enable for self-reflection in reading Quran, how we can argue that the methodology uh, categorized into scientific in current era? That's from uh, Scientific? Uh, scientific how? in current era. Okay. Uh, in terms of ishtihad, what, what is the limitations of ishtihad when it comes to waqf? I think the limitations of ishtihad is not the opinions of the madhahib. It is the Quran and the Sunnah. And the opinions of the madhahib are more or less part of the history of fiqh, not the real fiqh of awqaf. You see, there is a difference between fiqh and the, and the history of fiqh. When you talk about an issue like al-awqaf, fiqh today is changeable, is different. We have a different economy, as we mentioned, different institutions, different definition of anything. There are fixed matters, like masajid, for example, and the, mas the masajid or the mosques are going to be the same, but there are many, many changes. And we should go back to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, not to the madhahib necessarily and the history of the ijtihad. Once we realize that the Quran and the Sunnah have very few uh, uh, direct hadith, for example, about awqaf. Why? So that it's flexible, so that we can make 
rules, uh, new rules in the new environment. So I believe that the ijtihad and awqaf should be open and we should ask new questions. I wrote a paper recently about giving a zakah to the awqaf. And I know that this is the opinion that scholars of the past did not agree with. Why? Because the zakah was collected by the government and the zakah, I mean, there are a number of reasons, but I wrote a paper with a new ijtihad in which I uh, called for giving zakah to the awqaf so that we build institutions with part of the zakah, not necessarily all the zakah. And these institutions are important. I can send the paper as well. I cannot attach your papers here, but you can email me and I can send you the papers and the books, inshallah, and you can uh, read about that. Uh, the question about self-reflection, I didn't understand the question. I Please forgive me. Um, self-reflection. If you can repeat it again, I can perhaps. Okay. Uh, since the Makosit methodology unable to self, uh, unable for self-reflection in reading Quran, how, Only the Quran. We, uh, how we can argue that the methodology categorized into scientific in current era? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it depends on what you mean by scientific. Uh, if you are coming from a social sciences perspective and you mean by scientific as in Durkheim or Hegel or Kant, that's not what I'm talking about. But if you are coming from a social sciences perspective and you mean by scientific Islamic, then please read that book. Send me an email. I'll send you a copy of the book and you can read it and uh, you can see how we propose a methodology that is scientific uh, for today. Do Are we calling for people to read the Quran? Yes. Even if they don't know Arabic? Yes. Even if they don't know Arabic, they can read the translation and they will learn about the economics and politics and architecture and arts and psychology and war and peace and management because the Quran is full of that. The Quran is full of talk about management. But you have to have management eyes. If you are a management sciences person, and your eyes are good with management, when you read the Quran, you will see things that I don't see because I studied law. And when I read the Quran, I look at law, family law, criminal law. I look at that, but I don't understand psychology. If you are a psychologist and you read the Quran, your eyes will see psychology or your eyes will see war and peace, international relations, or uh, your eyes will see philosophy because your background is like that. Are we calling for people who are not trained in the Sharia to read the Quran? Yes, we are. Not to give fatwa because fatwa is different. You can ask me, inshallah, about you know family law, and, and I can give you a fatwa. But if you are a psychologist, I'm not asking you to give fatwa in divorce and custody, but I'm asking you to give fatwa about psychology because I cannot give fatwa about psychology. I don't understand that. And I'm asking you as well, to give a fatwa about psychology away from Freud. Please don't build your fatwa on Freud. Build your fatwa on the critique of Freud. And if you study economics, don't build it on Marx. Critique Marx or critique whatever, Chicago school. And if you are a political scientist, don't go Machiavellian and you claim to be Islamic. No, you have to critique that. And inshallah, you will read more in that book that I sent, inshallah. Thank you, Professor. Uh Still many questions. No problem. Next. I'd be free to tell them. Okay, the next question from Miss Risa Rosida. How yeah. Wakaf can maintain the food security for the society looking back to the experience of earlier Muslims? Is there any best practice that can inspire us on how Wakaf can help people on that issue? Perhaps one question by one question, my sister, I would really appreciate. So uh, to answer this, that food security is to make sure that um, the, the cash goes to an institution. Or if you want to donate an asset, a building or something, you can also donate an institution to feed the people. Um, that's one way of feeding the people through awqaf. Another way of feeding the people through awqaf is to build a market, as I mentioned. From the waqf, like the old markets, they were awqaf. So you donate a place that is going to be a public market so that people could come and sell food. And they make money out of selling food and they could also give people 
out of charity. You could also have um, different funds that are dedicated for that. I think we should have a project for food and water and so on through the Awqaf. And that is a very important project. And feeding the hungry is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about in the Quran in many places. Uh, and it's important. It's something that we should develop institutions for. So the waqf for feeding the hungry. And then people donate, and then it feeds the hungry, inshallah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, to the participants, you can ask, still ask your question by raise your hand, since I still read the question from the comment box. So the next question from Mr. Abdur Rauf Ibrahim. Does the objective of Wakaf have limitation? If so, how to determine the limits of the objective Wakaf? However, if Wakaf has no objective limitation, what is the best method for determining whether a program or activity should use the Wakaf model or another Islamic social finance model? Well, no, it doesn't have a limitation from my perspective. It depends on the place and time. Uh, the limitation is the hududullah, the limits that Allah set. If there is anything haram or riba or any of that, but there is no limitation for the thinking of waqf. And what you called, akhi, social, uh, social programs, that is the waqf from the Islamic perspective. You see, the social programs in Islam are two things, awqaf and sadaqat. Awqaf are the endowments that we talked about in the lecture. Sadaqat is either zakah or uh, sadaqa or charity. That, that is the, the philanthropy in Islam. These are the two kinds. So we're talking about the same thing, inshallah, when we talk about the awqaf. Okay, thank you, Professor. So the copy of the professor's uh, books of yours, uh, we can share it to the participant. Uh, okay, after oh the book, yeah, yeah, I, I'll send it. I'll send it on WhatsApp. Let's say okay because I cannot attach it here for some reason. Okay, it's not allowing me. It's giving me Dropbox, and I don't have Dropbox. Okay, it's okay, Professor. So. Uh, but can, I can, yeah, yeah, can. I can, I can send it if you send me emails. I, I reply, and I will send it now to the organizers uh, by by um, by WhatsApp uh, to uh, Dr. Lee Sanchon. Okay, okay. So Dr. Nesta will forward the. You, you can forward to the participants, Okay. Uh, is there any question from the participants? You can ask. I see here uh, some questions on the chat. Oh, limitations, okay. Okay, so this, the question, the next question from Mr. or Ms. Washit. Many scholars argue that what is currently being developed in mainstream Islamic economics prefers a pattern of accommodation and appropriation of the mainstream economic tradition hegemony. In your view, how sure is the Makosid methodology to be one of the logical choices to reconstruct economics in a more genuine manner? Yeah, well, I think it's a matter of strategy. I think we should work in uh, two parallel lines. Uh, one of them has to do with trying to deal with the current system uh, through the Islamic finances uh, in a way that at least gives, um, gives protection for the Islamic institutions and the Islamic movements and so on, because you really cannot isolate yourself from the system. Otherwise, you are going to be choked. Uh, in Surah Al-Munafiqeen, the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites everywhere in the world, their strategy is to starve Muslims. So one of the important approaches is what is called the Tamil Islami or the Islamic finances, because I think that it funds important goals. It funds some universities and some charities and some. Is it 100% genuine? In my perspective, it is genuine if it does Qirat or sh Sharika, Sharika. But Murabaha, I disagree with Murabaha. I don't think that Murabaha is Islamic. That's my, my view. But if you do Qirat or Sharika, 
uh, or company really or you finance with risk then it's good but if you don't have risk then to me it's riba it's the same thing uh, as riba uh, how can the maqasid methodology differ because it defines the macroeconomics in a different way it defines wealth differently and it defines trade differently and if you read inshallah that book of mine uh, you could see that we are trying to restructure the discipline uh, and when you restructure this of course you have to be at the level of a researcher to restructure but if you restructure the discipline and remove the elements of riba from it then inshallah we should be able to build something in parallel to working with the system but we have to work with the system the political system and the economic system and the cultural system we have to be able to deal with the society i'm speaking to you in english here i prefer to speak in arabic but I have to speak in English if this is the language you understand me with, right? Um, because Arabic is the language of Islam, not because I'm Arab, because language of Islam, the Quran is in Arabic. But sometimes we have to deal with the current status quo because it is important to be realistic. Yet, we also have to learn Arabic and we also have to learn genuine Islamic economics and genuine Islamic uh, pol politics and genuine Islamic arts different from the current system. Thank you, Professor. So, the another question from Ms. Umi Rahman, who raised him, please. Mashallah. Ms. Umi Rahman. Um, she's on mute. If you can unmute her, please. Okay. Okay. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Auda. My name is Umi Rama. My name is Umi Rama from State Islamic University, uh, Raden Mas Said, Surakarta. Uh, I'm currently studying environment preservation by developing tourism business. Many villagers uh, in Indonesia uh, build community-based tourism using the villagers' uh, natural resources. Their purpose is uh, to enhance their uh, economic life. Do you think it could be categorized uh, into work of and how it uh, how we can do uh, this uh, phenomena in the of Makosid? Thank you. Barakallahu feekum. Well, the way to convert any business into work of is to make a foundation or an endowment. I think they call it foundation in today's legal language. I'm not sure about Indonesia, but it's called sometimes foundation or endowment or charity status or something of that sort. So you create a foundation that is a charity that people donate to. And that charity employs people who work in tourism, let's say. So instead of a company, you are actually working through a charity. What is the difference? The difference is that you are employed by the charity. You don't own the company. You're just, you just get a salary. But the charity grows and employs more people. And the employees get salaries, but they don't own the company. That's the different model. Of course, there is another model is to make a company and to own it and to employ people in the, in the usual company way. But I think the awqaf is important because it expands the purpose of the charity. You're saying it's a community-based tourism that obviously, inshallah, is doing you know halal tourism. If it is the case and the tourism is done in a halal way, then I think it should be a foundation or a charity so that it accepts donations and it accepts volunteers. And it's not a company. But when you have a company, you don't accept donations. It's just a company. You see, you have a capital. So I hope this answers the question, inshallah. Okay, because Umi Rahman, I have this uh, answer a question. So the next one from Miss Loni. She, uh, she has three questions. The first Masha. one, what do you think about function of bank in the concept of Islamic economy? What institution used to uh, use as an intermediary in Islamic economics, or does it need it? I mean the intermediary. 
The second, how is bank supposed to work in Islamic economic concept? And the third one, in Indonesia, wakaf collected by mosque used to renovate the mosque. Meanwhile, around the mosque, there are some family in the poor condition or children do not get good education because of the money problem. I think the problem is society understanding of wakaf and its function, how to make people see the broader meaning of function of wakaf. Jazakallah khair. What do you think about the function of the bank in the concept of Islamic economics? I am afraid that the concept of Islamic economics does not include banks. Um, but uh, if you have to have a bank, if there must be a bank um, in Islamic economics, then the notes have to be backed by a value. Like they have to represent gold or silver or any currency that is allowed in Islam, any good that has a value, a material value. Um, why? Because the notes without values are subject to inflation and deflation are subject. And, and when they inflate, I have $10 that could buy me something today. And then after one year, I cannot buy the same thing for $10. And after a hundred years, the $10 cannot even buy 10% or 5% of the same house or the same land. And that deflation is بخس. Allah said, do not take away the value from the people. And that is haram. So the, the function of bank in the economic system, the Islamic system, if there has to be a bank, the notes have to be equivalent to gold or silver, or something that is substantial. And when it is equivalent to gold and silver, you don't have inflation. That's a different philosophy. Uh, can, can we have an economy without banks? Yes, we can. It's a myth that we cannot have economy without a bank. This is just because we all grew up in the economic capitalist system. You know, the, the feds in the United States in the beginnings of the 20th century started to print money like that. But the century before that, the dollar was stable. The dollar did not have a, a, a reduce of its value. In fact, the value of the dollar, I mean, the golden dollar in the 19th century was going up. The value of the currency is going up. And then in the 20th century, until today, the value of the dollar lost 94% of the value of the dollar. So what you, you bought for $1 before, you cannot buy today for a hundred dollars. That is different. That that is not the concept in the Islamic economy. So, is it needed? No, it isn't needed. But if we have it, it has to go back to at least the tying to the metal. Of course, the Americans in 1971 they cut the the, the relation with gold, which was a small relation anyway, and and it became a disaster. I'm not sure why. The Islamic world did not wage war because of this. This is a disaster uh, on the whole world, on the Europeans too, not just, but well, that's what the Americans did. How is the bank supposed to work in Islamic economic concept? I mentioned that in Indonesia. Yeah, the issue of hunger versus giving money to the mosque. Uh, I think we should have priorities. And I think feeding the hungry is priority in Islam, more important than building a mosque. But I also have to say that people are hungry, not because of the mosques. People are hungry because of monopoly. People are hungry because of the economic policy and the wars, the international wars, and the, um, the, the IP that does not prevent, uh, that prevents the manufacture of medicine and the agriculture of seeds. And people are, people are hungry because of that, because of the companies that monopolize the seeds and monopolize the money and oil. And that's why people are hungry. But if, if as a donor, I have a 10,000 and I wanna give to the mosque or to the hungry person individually, I should give to the hungry person, not to the mosque. This is my uh, take as, uh, as a donor. But people are hungry is not because of the mosque. I was asked recently in the Hajj, times uh, on the Arab TV, I was asked uh, whether people should do Hajj or Hajj 
or give to the poor because we have so many poor now in the Arab world. So I told them on TV, on Jazeera, I mentioned that people are hungry, not because people go on Hajj. People are hungry because of the monopoly of the markets and because of the corrupt political systems. It's not because we go to Hajj. So no, go to Hajj and inshallah, we ask for people uh, to, to be less monopolist, inshallah. Thank you, Professor. So another question from Ms. Umi Rahma. Professor, what do you think of Wakaf, which is limited with period of time, such as Wakaf shopping building for 20 years? Yeah, wallahi, the, uh, Wakaf is not defined like that. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, had mentioned to Umar عنه, uh, that he should give that piece of land and not take it back. Uh, if you want to do work for a limited period of time, that is different. That is called Umrah. Umrah, if you want somebody to live in a house uh, until they die or live in a house for 10 years, that is a donation. That is not a waqf. But a waqf by definition is supposed to be forever because part of the philosophy of waqf, as I mentioned, is sustainability sustainability of that it has to be sustainable and and perpetual continuous and therefore no i cannot just make a walk for 10 years i can make a donation for 10 years and it's good donation i tell them okay for 10 years i will donate the crop of the land uh, to charity but if i want to make walk what is the difference the difference is that if i make a limited time then i still own the land I own the land, then the land, the ownership didn't go anywhere. I own the land, but the crop goes to the poor. But if I give a waqf, I don't own the land anymore. I don't have ownership. And if, if I die, I don't have inheritance from that land. Uh, that's different from when you do a charity, because if you die, the charity continues, but the inheritance goes to the, the heirs, al waratha that is different. So that's the difference, inshallah. So the answer is no. Allah Alam. Uh, uh, do you see any other questions? There are a couple of questions in, uh, in Bahasa. My Bahasa is not that good. Uh, no, just some comments not the questions just uh, salamat and so on okay so <laughs> I'll okay uh, another question maybe from the participants you can raise your hand mashallah i will uh, leave my email again for those um, i sent the book to the organizers and i also left my email for, oh yeah for the Contact eventually yeah, yeah the sense. file will be forward to the participant after this seminar okay alhamdulillah we answered all the questions alhamdulillah okay. <laughs> excellent no questions again so thank you professor for the very Mecca oh, for inviting me and uh, inshallah, Allah bless your work. And uh, thank you, Dr. Alisa. Thank you, all the team for organizing this. I hope that, uh, you know, I, I brought some uh, useful ideas uh, to you and I'm more than happy to continue the discussion, inshallah. Zakumullah. Okay. Thank you, Professor, mashallah. So we actually have 60 minutes for the presentation, but we, but uh, finally we have more uh, the Q and A question or the discussions. So before, so thank you for the participants. Uh, before the presentation starts, uh, sorry, from before the presentations ends, we come to the end of seminar. So before closing this seminar, we. The what the speaker said. So 
the outcome or walk off, uh, it is not only the charity but also the sustainable. We also discuss about the let's say to the walk off and the uh, uh, the issues the of walk off in Indonesia from uh, from the participants who ask who ask answer the question to the professor. Once again, thank you, Professor, for joining. To the end of the seminar, uh, we that's all the agenda we have presented to you all today. Let us uh, let us close the seminar by reciting Hamdala. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Al Asr. In the insan, Allah fi khusr. Illa ladina amanu amanu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Rabbana la tuakhidna an nasina wa akhtaqna. Rabbana la tahmil alayna isran kama hamiltahu ala ladina min qablina. Rabbana la tahmilna ma la taqata lana bihi wa afu anna. Wa aghfir lana wa arhamna. Anta maulana falsurna ala qawm kafirin. Zakumullah khair. Barakallahu fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you to the presentation. Thank you everyone. See you on the next occasion. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.